for our keynote speech. If I get asked that you wrap up your conversations or carry them into the foyer next door, that'd be wonderful. We're very lucky that Mr. Tom Sire is here with us today. He uh, just hopped off a plane and we'll have to jet soon after, so we do want to respect his time. First, we'll actually have uh, Catherine Wolfram, who is a co-director of the Energy Institute at Haas, introduce uh, Mr. Tom Sire, um, and she'll also explain what UC Berkeley has done to shape California policy in the energy sphere. And then we will wrap up uh, after, after Mr. Sire's keynote speech with uh, words from Dr. Paul Wright, from the head of the Berkeley Energy and Climate Institute. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to all of you for coming. This has been a really inspiring set of talks and panels. I'm Professor Catherine Wolfram at the Haas School of Business. I'm also the co-director of the Energy Institute at Haas. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our key, uh, keynote speaker, Mr. Tom Steyer. The last time I was at a conference with Tom, I had the unfortunate task of following Tom. Uh, I had to present an academic paper after Tom's keynote, so Tom got the audience roused up. It was an, ex an incredibly inspiring speech, and then I had to bring people back down to data tables and analysis plans. So I'm delighted today to have the reverse, uh, to, to precede Tom instead of follow him. Tom's the founder, and until several months ago, the, a senior managing partner at Farallon Capital, and he has literally thrown off his gloves and is getting down and getting his hands dirty in the fight against climate change. So he's widely known as a forceful advocate for clean energy and for action on climate change. I would say, this is my view of Tom, that he's done more to bring the public and probably more importantly, politicians' attention to climate change than droughts in the Midwest, than Hurricane Sandy, uh, and then the increasing drumbeat of scientific evidence on the dangers associated with cl climate change. So I'm guessing that most of you in the room are listening to the music and listening to the drumbeat, but let me just give one fact that I think highlights the, difficult, the difficulty in Tom's task. Uh, I have a colleague at Haas who is a psychologist and he's run a study where he's put people in two different, almost identical rooms and he's asked them you know, whether they believe that climate change is a proven fact. The only difference between the two rooms is that one is hot and the other isn't so hot. And it turns out that the hotter the room, the more people say that they believe uh, that climate change is a proven fact. So, in the face of this type of decision making, it's difficult to figure out what the right approach is to, to getting people to listen to, to climate change. So according to recent news reports, Tom and several colleagues are commencing a study to look at the economic impacts of climate change. And my interpretation of this is that they're really helping to translate climate change into terms that people are, are familiar with and, and can identify with. So as an economist myself, I wanted to say a bit more about what we at the Energy Institute at Haas are doing in terms of research along these lines. We're engaged in studies both on the cost of climate change, so for instance, looking at increased energy usage as a function of higher temperatures. Uh, we're also interested in policy options to help mitigate climate change. So for instance, we have a new joint initiative with MIT to help ensure that we're making the most of energy efficiency programs and that we're not uh, relying too heavily on energy efficiency programs if they're, if they're unproven. So I'm delighted as somebody who's working hard on these issues that somebody with as big a megaphone as uh, Tom Steyer is, is taking them on and bringing them to all of our attention. So with that, I'm delighted to turn it over to Mr. Tom Steyer. So uh, thank you, Catherine, and thank you guys very much for having me here. Um, 
Last, I know that Catherine described this as a keynote speak, but key, keynote speech, but I would describe this as Friday afternoon. <laughs> so I very much appreciate the fact that you made the dubious choice to stick around and hear what I had to say, in spite of the fact that it's a beautiful day and it's Friday afternoon and that there are a lot of things to do in the Bay Area at this time. Um, I also would like to say that being compared to Hurricane Sandy and the drought in the Midwest is one of the more flattering things that someone has said about me. I, I like to think of myself as a natural disaster in my own small way. Um, and before I start, I'd like to make one last point, which is I spoke last Saturday before the football game to the returning class of 1968 who were actually a pretty neat class, and we had Dan Kamen and I and a couple other people talk to them. And I noticed that I, was the, I thought I'd be polite and wear a tie, and I've been wearing a red tie to work for longer than the undergraduates here have been alive. And so I thought I'd be polite and wear a tie, and I realized that I was the only person wearing a red tie within several miles. And that was pointed out to me, but yet somehow I did it again today. So I'll apologize at the start, um, but I do have it on. Um, I did quit my job. I had been a professional investor for 30 years. I'd been to business school. I'd worked on Wall Street on a couple of stints, and I started an investment firm, mostly for endowments and foundations, 28 years ago. And we had offices around the world in every continent except Africa, um, and I was highly overpaid and quite comfortable. We had really good systems. Life seemed to be very good, and I did quit at the end of last year. And I want to talk a little bit about why I think we're at a point where someone who purports to be rational would make that decision, and also why I think that actually we're going to win, and how we're going to do that, and why it is inevitable, in fact, that the people who are in this room, and I'm making some assumptions about the way you guys think, but why, in fact, we're going to end up winning and how we're going to do it. Um, the reason that I got involved in energy is basically that I know how to read. And anybody who can read can pick up the paper and see, wow, there's something going on here, and it seems like a big threat. And this is not the first time I've ever had that feeling, because you know I'm older than most of the people in this room, but it happened with, there was a hole in the ozone layer, and there was acid rain, and both times you'd pick up the paper for a couple years and think, wow, there's something really wrong here. But that's why we have a government. And eventually they're going to take care of this. And eventually they did take care of it, and so I could go back to sleep. And in terms of energy, it's the biggest industry in the history of the world. And I kept reading, and it kept not getting solved. So I started to think, you know, in my... I, that there was something I should be participating in about it, and we, my wife and I started to endow some research at different universities to say, you know, universities are a locus of thought. Let's try and push it a little faster so that we can solve this problem a little sooner because it doesn't seem from reading the papers as if, you know, we really have our act together. So we did that, and then in 2010, I got semi-drafted to co-chair a no on, a, on Proposition 23 because they wanted it, a Democrat to co-chair it with George Shultz, who has been, who's a Republican who'd been in the Eisenhower administration, the Nixon administration, and the Reagan administration. And there were a couple of out-of-state oil companies who were trying to change our energy laws, and people thought that they would probably win, and therefore they needed an idiot to co-chair it with George to spend a bunch of money and probably lose. But actually, we got 70% of the vote. So I first want to talk about what we learned in 2010 from running the No on 23 campaign. We learned a bunch of things about how to think about energy and climate politically. And we were defending California's basic energy laws, which are the most progressive in the world. So it really wasn't so much a fight about policy. This was just a pure political fight. And we did it very differently from the traditional way that these fights had been fought in California and around the United States, which traditionally the framework is jobs versus the environment. Which are you going to vote for? You know, which is more important to you? And a bunch of environmentalists go up against a bunch of business people, and traditionally the business people win. 
And what we said was, no, we're going to do it completely differently. First of all, we're going to have a different message. We're not going to talk about polar bears. We're not going to talk about global warming. We're not going to talk about CO2. We're going to talk about jobs. We're going to talk about the health of Californians, and especially Californian kids. And we're going to talk about business, businesses that try and take advantage of citizens. Those are going to be our three messages. And in a proposition, you have to be pretty disciplined about message. So those were the only three messages we had. The second thing is we had different messengers. You know, we never, we didn't use environmentalists. The people who spoke about health, we had a woman who unfortunately has passed away, who was the head of the American Lung Association, who was a good friend of mine, talking about health. Because when the head of the American Lung Association talks to you about health and the ability of kids to breathe and avoid asthma, you tend to think she knows something and she cares about what she's talking about. And when we talked about jobs, we had business people talk about jobs, or we had organized labor people talk about jobs, because you figure those are the people who spend their time thinking about jobs all the time. If they say this is good for jobs, presumably they have some credibility and know what they're talking about. So we had a different message, we had a different messenger. And we also had a different coalition, because from the very beginning, if you, I like to read polls. Believe it or not, polls are super interesting. And I like to read election results too, and I like to get them broken down as much as possible, because the more broken down they are, the more you can kind of infer who cares about things and why. And if you do good focus groups, you can, you can get, take it a lot further than that too. And basically, what people think about the environment is not true in terms of voting patterns. The number one group in California, I think at this point probably a lot of you guys do know this, to consistently vote 20% ahead of the averages in terms of energy and the environment and climate is Latinos, number two group Asian Americans, number three group African Americans. So when we were gonna build a coalition to try and defeat Prop 23, we absolutely knew that environmental justice and environmental justice groups that reached into the different communities in California had to be a central part of what we were gonna do. And that was, all of those things were changes. Message, messenger, coalition, all of it was different. And we got 70% of the vote. I mean, we had some things break our way. In fact, the Giants were playing the Texas Rangers in the World Series about the same time, which was just a fluke, but. <laughs> so then in, in 2012, we ran a positive prop, which some of you might know about, but which was Prop 39, which basically was changing the way out-of-state companies pay state income tax because they'd been getting a break that was ridiculous. There was a loophole that was worth a billion dollars to the state of California. And we said, close the loophole, use half of it to retrofit the schools around the state for energy. The energy savings will go to the schools. We'll have better HVAC systems so the kids can breathe better. There's a huge health impact. Plus, we'll reduce our carbon footprint and do a good job on energy. Plus, energy efficiency is a huge job creator. So we had like nine different reasons why we thought this was a great thing for the state of California. Now, when you think about it politically, it's Prop 39. Like, that means there are a lot of props that come before it. <laughs> Second of all, it's complicated. You know, most propositions, if you want them to pass, you have to be able to explain it in two words, death penalty, three strikes, marriage equality. I mean, you gotta have something where people go like, I get it. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Okay, I told you, there's like four different things we were doing, so it was complicated. It's a presidential election year. There were a lot of high profile props on the ballot. So the question was, how are we ever gonna get anybody to focus on this? George Schultz, bless him, co-chaired it. Um, we worked really hard on, a, on getting a huge field effort. So I don't know how many, much you guys follow politics, but field is basically going back to the 18th century. That's when you go knock on your neighbor's door and say, do you know George Washington is running for president? And they go, really? He sounds good. Who else is running? <laughs> so what we did is we wanted to have a huge field effort because in fact, the way things work now, that is the most effective part of politics, crazily enough. We are back in the 18th century. But the problem is it's really hard to motivate 37 million Californians to talk about Prop 39. So what we do, but actually, we worked 
together with organized, we had the same coalition. We expect we're better on the business. We've been organizing clean tech businesses now for two and a half years. So we actually have a pretty good business voice in about 20 states of the United States, but definitely including California. But we got, we worked with organized labor to push yes on 30, no on 32, yes on 39. And they knocked on five million doors. So if you think about that, getting to five million doors is an incredible feat in the month before an election. And getting five million doors to hear about Prop 39 was something that honestly, I was shocked to think we could accomplish. And we really could never have accomplished it on our own, regardless of how much money we spent. So basically, I'd gone through those two political experiences, and I'd, done, you know, I'd dabbled in a few other things having to do with energy and climate on an investment side and also a uh, policy side. But basically, it didn't seem to me like we were any closer to getting the kind of policies that we need. And I want to talk a little bit, because I don't think the policy part here is that complicated. But I didn't get the sense that we were going where we wanted to go, and I got the sense that this urgency of this problem and the significance of this problem was more than I'd thought. And I, th I think, you know, I guess everybody thinks of themselves as being coldly objective, so that puts me in the other seven billion people on the planet, but I thought I was being objective about it. And so I quit my job because I felt like, look, I'm 56 years old, this is something where I feel like there's a problem here and for some reason our system is not fixing it. And our system fixes most problems very effectively. But for some reason, this wasn't happening. And I thought, you know what? All the jobs I've taken on in this so far have been basically being the garbage man. Everybody knows someone has to pick up the garbage, but not a lot of people get in line for that job. And I thought, maybe this is, the reason this isn't happening is this is a job that someone needs to do, and I need to figure out what I think that job is. But maybe it's not an attractive thing to do. Maybe there aren't a lot of people who really think this is what they want to spend their time doing. So I quit, and we spent a few months trying to figure out why this wasn't happening, what was wrong. And basically, it really isn't about the science. You know, I know you guys all know in this room that the IPCC came out with their fifth, you know, report, I think two weeks ago today, and basically, they were 95 to 100% confident that the planet was heating up and it was caused by human activity. So, you know, there is a significant disinformation campaign like the one that said, we're just not sure if smoking causes cancer. We need more time to see what happens. And there's a, there's a disinformation campaign out there that basically says, we're just not sure if there is climate change, and if there is climate change, we're just not sure if human activity relates to it, and if it, there is climate change caused by humans, we're not sure it's not good. It's because I actually went to, to go to their website to follow it, and actually it was like a legal brief. You know, A, my client was not near the liquor store, B, the liquor store may not have been robbed, and if it was robbed, it was probably good that it was robbed. <laughs> so. It's not about the science. It's also not about the policy. I do want to get to this in, in, in a short while, but basically, from a policy standpoint, this is pollution. And we have dealt successfully with pollution since 1970 when we passed the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And frankly, California has led the way in how to, pay, in how to deal with it, both from a cleanup standpoint and a policy standpoint. So when we think about the two issues that I mentioned that were big in the 80s, which was the hole in the ozone layer and acid rain, in both cases, under Republican administrations, they changed the policy, they basically included the cost of pollution in the cost of doing business, and lo and behold, business solved it much faster, much more effectively, and much, you know, more skillfully than anyone had, had imagined. And in fact, if you go back and read the Wall Street Journal editorials, they start with, there is no such thing as acid rain, and if there is, it's not caused by business. And if it is caused by business, it'll bankrupt us all if we have to deal with it. And then, by the time they passed the law, 
American business solved it really fast. And that was the last time you ever heard about that in the Wall Street Journal. So I don't think this is about policy. This is about politics. And if you look around the United States of America, this is, this is a huge political failure on a national level. We came very close, in some people's opinion, but not mine, to a climate bill in 2010. And you know, we're nowhere close to it now. And you, know, you can't pick up the paper and think that we're gonna have a significant policy achievement on a national level in Washington, D.C. on energy and climate in the foreseeable future. It's really impossible for me to imagine that right now. There'd have to be a wholesale change in Congress and the Senate to get the kind of votes to pass that. So from my point of view, it looks very much like a political failure. And so we tried to figure out what to do about that, whether that we could add anything to that. So we came up with a mission statement. And it turns out one of the annoying things about me is I really believe in mission statements because it's really hard to accomplish something if you don't determine what it is you're trying to accomplish. And a lot of times when you work with a bunch of people, you all assume that everybody agrees with you and that you all agree in what you're trying to do, but it turns out you don't. And so you have a very difficult and controversial conversation where you describe what you think it is you're trying to do and they explain that you don't know what you're talking about. And that's actually a really helpful process because that's how you define what it is you're trying to do together. So the process is every bit as valuable as the mission. But then in addition, once you have the mission statement, not only do you know what you're trying to do, you know what you're not trying to do. And that's incredibly helpful too, because people have a million different ideas and you can say to 999,999, that is a great idea, but it doesn't fit our mission statement. So here's our mission. Our mission statement is to act politically to prevent climate disaster and preserve American prosperity. That's it. And the things that are in there that are different from everybody else, I think, are political. We're explicitly saying the way that we think that we can deal with this problem or that we, we can help deal with this problem as part of a coalition working in a variety of ways is on the political side. And we don't think we can do that successfully unless we're also talking about a prosperous America. Because I think from a political standpoint, we're never gonna win saying to people, let's go back to the cave. You know, now is really a good time for the brontosaurus burger. No, we're, we really have to be able to explain this in a way that it's actually going to hit people in their gut in a good way. That this is not a terrible thing, that this is something that we're gonna accomplish, that's gonna be positive, and that we're gonna profit from. By the way, I, I'm sure everyone here knows Cal's mission statement motto, let there be light. I did not know that, but I love that. And in particular, I love that because this is the thing I worry about, let there be light. Cal is actually all over this topic in terms of research, the different labs, and the policies. So I'm actually very, very impressed. So let me just talk for a second about how we're gonna overcome this. I'll go into a little detail, but basically, and I like to say this to the people who don't like what I'm doing, that the three things that I think I stand for and that we're gonna fight for are democracy, that we're gonna, we believe the way to change this is the old fashioned way, 225 years, go to the ballot box and vote. Democracy, capitalism, that basically we're gonna rely on the system of our citizens, our initiative, our innovation, our research, to come up with the ways to solve this, and full cost accounting. And I did go to Stanford Business School, so I have a, uh, an unusual sense of why accounting can be a really important thing. But from my point of view, I say full cost accounting, and other people think boring business jargon, but as a business student, full cost accounting to me says complete truth and recognition of costs. Because what we're really dealing with here is a choice by an industry to try to continue not to pay for their pollution. And so, you know, if you give someone the right to dump their garbage in your yard and charge for garbage removal, they're gonna like that, and they're gonna make a lot of money doing that, and they're not gonna wanna stop. But that doesn't make it right. So if you take those three things, it's very hard for Tea Party people to think that they're against democracy, 
capitalism, or full cost accounting. And those are the three things that we really believe in. Now let me say this. How are, what does it really mean? What are we gonna do politically? We think we can go and work in elections. We think that, there, that that is how America changes. So right now we are working really hard in an election in Virginia for governor. Strangely, Virginia elects its governor the year after a presidential election. So that's actually the first Tuesday in November, 2013. One of the, the Tea Party candidate has sued the University of Virginia for fraud for teaching climate science. Perfect. He's a, you know, he's a big Koch brother recipient. He's everything. And he, when we started, he had a four point lead. And you know, there's a lot of water that's got under this bridge since he had a four point lead. But there has been, you know, he is a guy who, ha who had a very different reputation in Virginia when we started than he does now. So when we originally started, he had a reputation for probity which I think was unfounded and which I think no longer really exists because he'd done some things, including relating to energy. So he had, as the attorney general, sent memos and worked with an energy company to teach them how not to pay the lease payments they owed to Virginia citizens and then had taken a $100,000 campaign contribution from that company as in his governor's race. So that is one of the things where when you think about it, it's kind of like, Wow, you know, who would really do that? And if someone did that, would you think that would be a suitable person to be the governor of your state? Most people, including conservative people, because he did this actually in the most conservative part of the state, the part where there, the, the, where there are coal mines, where there are the people who are really the poorest in the state of Virginia live, and he did it to those people. So he, in effect, was doing something that was gonna alienate the people where he would have the highest percentage of voters in a normal election. So we think that we can change the outcome of elections, and we think that that's what politicians pay attention to. And I'll tell you a quick story about that, which is, you know, a friend of mine was going around talking about gun control. And he was talking to a senator, a female senator, about gun control and saying basically if you don't vote for background checks, you can show statistically more innocent kids will die. That there will be these crazy shootings in schools and people will die. And she admitted that was true and started to cry, but said I can't vote for it because I'll lose my job. I just can't do it, I know they're gonna die, but that's, you know, I just can't do it. And she was bereft and that my friend felt really bad for her. But I did not feel bad for her. Because I view that very simply as my job is more important than the lives of innocent six-year-olds. And I view the people who say to me, I understand climate science is true. I understand climate science is true, but I can't do anything about it because I'd lose my job in my district. That's saying I'd rather see the world end than lose my job. Okay, world end, my job. Uh, nope, my job. But that's no reason, you know, I look at it and say, that's the system. They're gonna reflect what's going on in their district. So we better know how to win in their district. And that's very simple, because as soon as they understand that they will lose their job, if they sue the University of Virginia for fraud for teaching climate science, when people understand that's how you lose your job, that's how we win. So from my point of view, a very, you know, kind of, mechanistic understanding of how elected officials think about their jobs, that's not cynicism, that's realism. And we've spent enough time being unrealistic about how we're gonna win here. I think it is time for us to be realistic and to deal with the facts and to understand that, you know, the average American spends five minutes a month on politics. That's it. They have so many more important things in their lives than listening to political arguments. You know, they've got to pay the bills, they've got to take care of their kids, they've got to see if they can have a little fun, they have, you know, fantasy football leagues that require massive attention. <laughs> Five minutes a month. 
So if you're going to win in politics, if you're going to get somebody, because polling is interesting, but people act like polling is wisdom. And polling is just a snapshot of how people answer a question at a moment in time. It's not wisdom. Polling can be changed, and in addition, it, it really doesn't matter from a political standpoint unless you understand salience. So I could really be teaching a, a Berkeley class here because I now used a three-syllable world. But the whole idea is if you won't change your vote, it doesn't matter. So we can be 100 to zero that, we, that polar bears should be allowed to live. But if no one changes their vote, it does not matter politically. You are not going to get that person, the elected official, to care unless they think that votes are being changed on that issue. So if it ain't important enough for you to change your vote, you don't exist. And that's the truth. And that's the issue here on energy and climate. If you poll Americans, they know the truth. They just, it isn't as important to them as other issues because it is not a visceral grab you in the gut when you're sitting around the kitchen table, this is gonna affect me, this is gonna affect my spouse, this is gonna affect my kids. And if they don't think that, that's not what they're gonna vote on because there is stuff that's gonna affect them and their spouse and their kids and that's gonna be what determines their vote and that's the thing that matters. So until we get in that position, until we have enough people changing their votes, to change elections, we don't exist. So that's our job. And that does not seem to me to be, you know, from what we can tell, the question is not can we do this, but how can we do this strategically? How does winning the governorship or, you know, affecting the outcome of the governorship of Virginia, how does that matter? Why did, you know, how does that matter in the, when we realize this is a global problem, we need a global solution, and the policy is fairly straightforward. How does winning a governorship in a purple state really make a difference? That's actually the real question. So let me just talk for one second about Berkeley. You know, the faculty here actually has done an amazing job, and there is a huge job for faculty. I mean. I think people here know a lot about policy, and that is a huge deal. And so in terms of, when I say policy isn't that tough, the assumption there is that we have brilliant faculty members around the country who actually know the right answers in a very complicated industry and could put it together when the time came. Because I, I do think the, it's easy for me to say it from 30,000 feet, but getting it right on the ground, and I know this from Prop 39, God is in the details of these things and getting the details right is extremely difficult and unbelievably important. So I think that's one place where there are lots of people here who do yeoman's work all the time on, on that. Let me say one other thing about research. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a scientific researcher and he was reminding me that in 1890 in New York, people were trying to think about what the big problem was, the big environmental problem. The big environmental problem in 1890 in New York was horse manure that basically New Yorkers were getting richer, and as they got richer, they bought horses, and the, they, did a, they extrapolated what was happening and said, by 1950, the horse manure in New York will be up to the third story. <laughs> and this is probably gonna be the thing that chokes New York off, you know, we really have to worry about this. And obviously, they missed, you know, the invention of the internal combustion engine that something really changed because you don't, that isn't actually how progress happens, where you extrapolate lines of what's been going on. Things change, thank God. And things are gonna change here. And the guy who I was talking to is actually trying to do this crazy thing, which is to invent an artificial leaf, to basically take sunlight and water and use it to create energy that then can be used cheaply around the world. And whether, in fact, he can, he can do that, whether he can do it cheaply enough for it to work is a question. But the one thing that seems to me to be, to me to be clear is we're not going to have horse manure up to the third floor in energy. There are scientists at Cal and at the laboratories associated with Cal and around the United States who are going to come up with amazing stuff. So if you think about, I'll give you what I think is the comparison. So I'm 56. So in 1983, the communications industry was, had a monopoly that ran everything and there was no innovation. 
We had rotary phones. It was very old fashioned. They broke up the monopoly. They deregulated the industry. And we have had 10,000 innovations, most of them from the Bay Area, research-based, innovation-based, all with the goal of making money. And now we have you know, a complete revolution that continues to morph all the time. And there's no reason to think that isn't what will happen in energy if we get the policy right, which depends on us putting through the policy and making it happen from a political standpoint. And that, what will, uh, that will be research-based in universities around the United States of America, including very significantly Cal. It will be you know, taking research and trying to commercialize it and see what you can do and have a product that's disruptive and wonderful. And I, you know, that's what a big, you know, universities are a huge function of creating research across the board. And this is the place where that's gonna happen. I also think the, uh, the role of California is gonna be particular. We have the most progressive energy laws in the world. We have an 8.9% unemployment rate when the national average is 7.3. We are creating the ideas in energy consistently. If you look at the patents by state, we're number one by a gigantic margin in energy. The research is being done here, the innovation is being done here, but we don't have a real significant number of jobs here relative to other states, strangely enough. And that is something where I'd say that too is policy, that making it possible for these companies to succeed is also important. I mean, in, in a sense, maybe it's okay that they go to other states to build their manufacturing plants, but as a selfish Californian, I would like to see us do well. And I would like to see the United States of America do well, and I'd like to see if we can do well in the best possible way. So I actually do see California. Everyone looks at us and says, you guys are crazy. I mean, I don't know how much you guys travel around. I don't know how, much, how many of you guys actually live in California as opposed to just go to school here. But when I go around, I, I literally was in Las Vegas talking to these sheet metal workers this morning. And I was saying, you know, well, California, we like to lead. You know, we went bankrupt before you did. We had a legislature that didn't work before you did. You know, we basically had to find our democracy where we could when, you know, the, our equivalent of Congress failed just the way you're going to have to. And I said, but I know you guys all think Congre that California's crazy. And this guy in the back of the room literally goes, you are! <laughs> so I know people think that, but I also know they watch us like hawks. And so if we have, we use half as much energy per capita as the rest of the country. We have more expensive kilowatt, more expensive kilowatt hours, but we use half as much energy per capita. And there are a whole bunch of reasons for that, including cost, but not just cost. If we do well, if we have the right energy laws, if we go through this and we do well economically, that is the most powerful statement we're gonna to make to the world. We are an incubator proving that doing the right thing is important. Now I believe that when, you know, I think the 317 million Americans are d Democrats with a small d. We believe in democracy. I'm not the only person in this country who thinks the ballot box is sacred. We really believe that. In California, when our legislature failed, which it failed for the same reason that basically a minority part of a minority party had a veto on progress. I mean, it wasn't that they could get done what they wanted to get done, but they could prevent a budget from being passed. For those of you who lived here, there was 10 years of reading California in crisis, California bankrupt, we paid with script. I mean, it was really, sounds very, very, very familiar to me. But so we used the propositions. We used dem direct democracy. The number of things that went directly to the people is astonishing when you look back. Because representational democracy had basically broken down and it wasn't going to work and no one thought it was gonna work. So the question is, we don't have propositions in the United States of America. How are we, it comes back to the question I asked earlier, what does it matter if we can help elect the right person and prevent the wrong person from being elected in Virginia. Why does that matter? Here's my answer. I'm not, and this is a thesis that is untested, but this is what I think. We are going to have to lead on this as a country. You know, this is a global problem that needs leadership, and it, 
we are not going to be the only leaders, but there is no coalition in the world that can make, that can deal with this problem without the United States of America. We have the political credibility, we have the technology, we have the financial clout. We're, believe it or not, I still think we're very trusted around the world to try and do the right thing. I don't think there's any other country that can for, fulfill that role, although we will obviously need partners in leading the way. So from my point of view, when we think about why does Virginia matter, it has to be a question of how are we going to get to a place where we lead or participate in that coalition to change the world? And the answer is, if it's not going to come out of DC, then it's going to have to come from a combination of states. And if we can get a combination of states working together, which I actually believe we can, we're not going to get all of them leading the way. Not only can we lead the way and hook up with other countries, but in addition, that puts enormous pressure on Washington to act. And if they don't act, then we'll just keep going. Because the truth is, we have to have a strategy to win, not a strategy to fight. I'm not interested in fighting. I am interested in winning. And if we have a strategy where we just try, you know, we just kind of keep going, come on, someday it'll work, I am not interested. I have to believe that we have a way to win, and this is a way to win. And that is something I am incredibly interested about. So let me then talk about what the people in this room can do. Because I think that, to a large extent, the majority of Americans know this is a problem and they think it's an overwhelming problem that they can't address. And that they really, there's nothing for them to do and therefore there's no point in spending time on it because if you can't affect it, let's just forget about it and have a slightly nicer day. I mean, who really wants to dwell on this? Well, for, the first thing I'd say is we will inevitably win this because the facts ultimately come out and it, everybody now knows that smoking causes cancer. There's not a lot of question anymore even if all the CEOs of cigarette companies stand up and swear they're not sure, I don't think a lot of people are wondering in the United States anymore whether cigarettes cause cancer. There's not gonna be a lot of people wondering about whether what's going on is a change in climate. So I know that we're inevitably gonna win. In this case, strong feelings are not enough. You know, democracy is not a spectator sport. Feeling strongly about this actually, I guess it might motivate you to vote differently but actually to change this, we're gonna to have to be active and not passive. I don't think you can feel, I honestly, I'm grateful to you for spending part of your Friday afternoon instead of enjoying California, but listening to me, but that probably won't be enough. <laughs> um, I think, when I think about it from the point of view, and I've got four kids between the ages of 19 and 25, I do think political organization is a huge part that the idea of going back to the 18th century and being involved politically is something that actually is incumbent on us as citizens. That basically, this is going to be a societal change. And it's gonna to have to come because people decide that it's important enough to change society. So if you think about you know, the huge all hands on deck effort it took to win World War II. People did things on their own. They, had, they planted victory gardens. And that was a good thing, and I actually think it's important for us to think about what we're doing with our own lives. You know, what kind of car are we driving? How are, you know, what is our carbon footprint? How are we affecting the world? I actually think that's really important, particularly if you're gonna be involved politically, particularly if you're gonna to talk to other people about it. I think it's important to have a base that is true and safe, which, you know, I think Martin Luther, called, Martin Luther King called self-purification. I think that's important. But I also don't think we won World War II because people had victory gardens. I think that really to change this, we're gonna to have to make a societal change and put in the policies that are gonna enable the whole society to do things differently. So in World War II, we did not make passenger cars in Detroit. We made tanks, we made ships, we made airplanes. We did not make passenger cars. People went off, they picked up rifles and went off and had to you know, do a really dirty job. This is not a really dirty job by comparison. This is a really easy job by comparison. But we're gonna have to actually do it. So I look at this and say, A, get in, for, for the people here, you have to be involved politically if you really think this is the generational challenge. I don't think you cannot do that. And the second thing is, I think it's really important for people to get good at something. 
that if you are, I had dinner with some people who are, com they retrofit commercial office buildings. So if you think about a normal job, it's basically taking a rundown office building, a C office building that you know is crummy and the systems are old and fixing it up, but they're doing it from an energy standpoint. You know, at actually taking, being good at fi fi fixing office buildings, you then can put this to work. This can be something that shapes the way you do a job, but actually doing a job well, whether you're a lawyer, a business person, a venture capitalist, or you fix up office buildings. This is a way to inform your life and give it meaning, which believe it or not, when you get to be 56 years old, is gonna seem really important to you. I know when, you're, when I was younger, I, you know, you're kind of struggling and trying to figure out what the heck am I gonna do? Am I ever gonna find a job? Am I ever gonna you know, really find my way in the world? But the fact is, having a reason for doing what you're doing and letting it inform what you're doing makes life much more interesting and much more fun and you have much more impact. So when you think about how this is gonna work, I think the two things that you can actually do are let it inform what you're getting good at and try it really hard to be good at something and be involved politically in an active way because those are the two things that if we do, we will solve this and I'm highly confident that the American people will change energy from being an extractive kind of dopey industry, although we happen to be really good at the technical parts of it, to an innovation research-based industry where like telecommunications, we blow everybody's mind by coming up with stuff that no one had ever thought of. And I promise you in 1983, no one had thought about the gamification of the web. They'd never thought of the web, they'd never thought of gamification. The whole idea was ridiculous. That's where we're gonna have to get to and that's where I'm highly confident we will. Thank you. So, Thank so you, Tom. If, if you are self-destructive enough to want to ask a question and to realize that you are now going to compel other people to stay out of the sun for slightly longer, go right ahead. So we had note cards going around, those have been collected, and also questions that were posted to the app. I uh, will be voicing them here so that everybody can hear and they get recorded along with the answers. So uh, to start out, when you talk to other business leaders and lay out your argument that climate matters, what needs to be done about it, uh, do you find they agree with you and they're receptive or are there any groups that uh, have a bad reaction and how okay. do you So let me divide this up that? into three groups. That would be the clean tech people who we deal with and who we've been organizing for the last two and a half years. The high finance people who we deal with who are old friends of mine from investing and the energy groups. So the clean tech people are all over this. And, I, try, and we, I tell them, in order to win, we need a business voice. You have to participate. You're, we, in fact, the Koch brothers and their allies have tried to roll back renewable portfolio standards and energy efficiency standards around the United States in 2013. We've had a series of fights. Believe it or not, we're, o, we're 57 and 0 against these guys in 2013. They've brought it up in deep red states. They really have not won one time knock on wood. And so the business, that kind of business voice exists. We've been working really hard to try and, the jobs are growing very fast and we're trying really hard to make it happen in blue states, purple states, and red states. Secondly, I had an experience, I think it was a little over a year ago where I was invited when I was still a full-time investor to go down to the treasury and have dinner with a couple of senior treasury officials and four or five other investors. So we have this dinner, it's like in August of 2012, and we talk for an hour and a half about everything, you know, how Europe's going, how Asia's going, the mortgage crisis, you know, the dollar, tax rates, politics, you name it. So we're about to leave. I, I, I figure we're gonna be there an hour and a half, it's about an hour and 15 minutes. And I said, look, I don't, I don't think we're talking about what I think is gonna be the overwhelming economic fact over the next five years, but I'm sure is gonna be the overwhelming economic fact over the next 10 years, which is energy. And they all go, you're so right, fracking, 
absolutely, you nailed it, Tom. And I was like, no, not fracking, <laughs> climate. And they're like, climate? What's climate got to do with it? So shockingly, <laughs> it had not crossed their mind, and most of these guys were from New York, it had not crossed their mind two weeks before Superstorm Stan Sandy that there was something going on in the planet that had to do with temperature and emissions and climate. So truthfully, it's, it's pretty amazing to know how little a lot of finance people think about this. And the third is, energy is the most profitable business in the history of the world. And it, it doesn't make you a bad person, but when you're making billions of dollars or tens of billions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars, it's pretty hard to think it's not a good thing. And so it's pretty hard to think. I, I am highly convinced that some of the companies who really think that what we're talking about is nutty, in the end will be significant positive agents, agents of change. But along the way, if you look, look at how much we're allowed to produce, you know, you know, we're capable of producing, we're gonna have to push pretty hard to get things right in order to do the right thing. And we can't worry about whether there are certain shareholders who are gonna lose money on that. I just think that's gonna be the way, you know, people lost money when people came up with the touch-tone phone. The people making rotary phones got kind of screwed. And that's just the way, you know, it's, that's the way capitalism works. If you make, if you own the wrong thing that's no longer profitable and can't be, you know, is no longer significant, you become Eastman Kodak and you go out of business. Or you become Polaroid. People aren't taking a lot of Polaroids these days. You know, that's unfortunate, it's sad, but basically, you know, you gotta adapt and these people are very smart, they'll adapt. So that, that's what I would say. Business is a mixed bag, but politically we have to break even with business. We have to have people believing that business will be, and job creation will be a significant part of this effort. It's true, and, we, and it's counterintuitive for a lot of Americans, so we need to make sure they understand that. I'll just take one more second on this, because this drives me crazy. You know, we've been making some noise about the pipeline, and we've been pushing hard against the pipeline for a whole bunch of reasons. But the argument for the pipeline is simple, which is it's gonna create jobs. And I could attack that on a million reasons. You know, there are jobs and then there are jobs and doing the wrong thing and creating job might not be the greatest thing anyway. But they always act as if either we're gonna build the pipeline and create energy that way and create jobs or we're gonna do nothing. Well, no, that's not true. If we don't build the pipeline, we're still gonna have energy and we're gonna generate it a different way and the different way is gonna create a lot more jobs. It's like saying we're gonna build a bridge from the East Bay to San Francisco, and we're either gonna do it with steel, which is gonna create a lot of jobs, or we're just not gonna build the bridge. Well, no, that's not quite right. We're gonna build the bridge, but maybe we'll use aluminum. So that's a totally false comparison that people take extremely seriously and act as if that was really realistic, like we're either gonna have this energy or we're just not gonna have energy. And that is nuts. Well, you tee up the next question pretty well because uh, this question asker wanted to know that as you alluded to green job initiatives earlier, uh, do you think that something is lost by focusing on jobs and economics and making the uh, argument to people who care about that uh, rather than environmental impacts of our decisions and really honing in on the personal? I think that's actually a great question. I really do. And I, I, I want to explain what a little bit of you know, if I have any nuanced thinking, it might be a little on this. When you talk to people about voting, you have to talk to them about things they care about. So if you said to Bill Clinton, what is the job of a politician? He would say the job of a politician is to take a complicated policy and put it into terms that are meaningful for somebody who doesn't think about policy. That that's what, you know, if you think about mend it, don't end it, all the different taglines they had, you know, don't ask, don't tell. He was always trying to take a complicated idea and put it in layman's terms so that people could relate to it. So what we've been trying to do in elections is put it into terms that people care about. To be honest, not to be deceptive, 
but to try and talk in terms that people can hear. And there's a drawback to that, which is it's also really important that people in our society understand that we have a, an urgent crisis to be dealt with. And if you talk only about jobs and only about the most short-term specific things that affect people, something is lost, which is what's lost is kind of the background. And I think that it is really important at the same time that we are fighting specifically specific political battles on spe specific political points that the overall point also be made about climate and CO2 and change. And so I view this in a sense as, and I, I'll apologize for using a second military uh, analogy. It's like you want the ground war where you chew them up on the ground and you basically are going in for hand-to-hand -hand combat in a specific election and you want air cover. And the air cover is that you dominate the intellectual airwaves about what's actually going on. And you really can't win without both. And that's the truth. But you use them in different contexts. You use different messengers. And they are all part of a big coalition of people pushing the same way but having different jobs. So you don't have an infantryman flying your planes. That's what I'd say. Speaking of voting and elections, would you consider funding primary challenges against sitting Democratic politicians who are not progressive on climate? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but earlier this year, 20, there aren't that many elections in 2013, so there are not many to choose from, but John Kerry, as you probably know, got appointed Secretary of State, which opened up a uh, vacancy in the Senate, and there was a primary in Massachusetts between a conservative Democrat who had voted the wrong way on energy consistently, and actually Ed Markey, who was the named person in the Waxman-Markey climate bill. And so we actually spend a lot of time and effort in Massachusetts trying to expose the other gentleman, who I'm sure is, you know, is a good person in many ways, but who, from our point of view, was a very bad choice for the Senate, as a Democrat, exposing him as someone who was standing for things that he should not be allowed to get away with and be in the U.S. Senate. You know, he'd voted for the pipeline, he'd voted against subsidies for any renewables, he voted for subsidies for oil and gas. It was like he had a pretty consistent, terrible voting record. And so we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that Ed Markey was the person who won in the primary and there were a bunch of our friends who were Democrats who felt like it was just outrageous what we were doing. And we could not get a single environmental organization to go along with us on that. However, that did not dissuade us from doing it. And just one last question, because we are out of time now. Um, what is your, your hope for, and realistically, where we are in five or 10 years talking about this subject. You know, I, I have a friend who actually uh, works at Cal, who's the CFO of Cal, who, who I worked with for a number of years. And he quoted to me a few years ago um, a line from Ernest Hemingway, which was, how did you go bankrupt? I went bankrupt two ways, very slowly and then all at once. And how do I think we're going to win this? And you know, why do I think that in five or 10 years, not only will we have won, but we will have to have won? You know, we will have to have won in five to 10 years because it is like we are driving a car at 100 miles an hour towards a cliff. You can't get one inch from the cliff and go, you know something? We're approaching a cliff. <laughs> it's way too late. So we actually, there's huge pressure on us to get to, to win in five to 10 years. So when I think about it, I view this as, how are we gonna win this? Very, two ways, very slowly and then all at once. Because I think at some point, we roll this, where people realize, if you're wrong on this, this is the generational issue that you get judged by. That, I think, is the critical point for us. And if you think about it in, in terms of the other great generational challenges in the United States, we've had them. And if you think about it, 
being wrong on the great generational challenge is suicide for you in the long run. So, you know, I always tease people whose families have been around for a long time, do you remember how your family stood on the great tariff challenge of 1873? No one remembers there was a great tariff challenge of 1873, and if they do, they have no idea what their ancestors thought about it, although I'm sure they felt very strongly about it. No one is going to remember the great budget challenge of 2013, or the debt ceiling, or any of this stuff. This is very temporal th stuff. This is stuff that will be forgotten in a matter of weeks. Where they stood on energy and climate, to me, is going to be where they stood on the great challenge, question, decision of the day. You can't be wrong on the great decision of the day. And I, I, don't, I can go back through American history and point out, everybody remembers where they stood on the great decisions of the day. And that's what I think this is. And when elected officials figure that out, that their biography is going to read, but was wrong on energy and climate, <laughs> that's when we get it fast. And that's where we have to get to, because that's actually the truth. Thank you. A big thank you to Tom Steyer. That was an inspirational call to action, taking the, the big picture uh, and making it relevant at the federal level and also at the personal level. And now for uh, the last few minutes here, I'd like to take it back to our university level and invite uh, Dr. Paul Wright up here uh, director of Berkeley Energy and Climate Initiative, talk about what we are able to do here. Thank you. Uh, I just have five minutes to tell you that I'm another guy that quit his job recently. I'm serious, because I was running an organization on the north side of campus called the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, or Citrus. It's that large seven-story building on Hearst. And so around Christmas time, Paul Alavisatos at the lab and the chancellor, then Bob Bergino and Graham, uh, asked me to switch from being the Citrus director to the Becky director. And just like Tom spoke then, I felt that it was my job, my responsibility to do that. And so as of July 1, I started organizing the Berkeley Energy and Climate Institute. You saw Danny Cullen Ward speak earlier on. He's our fellow. Sean Waihira over here is our analyst, and the three of us are a small startup in terms of doing it to make this all big part of the picture. Now, you know, I'm also a mechanical engineering professor, and my bench science is to do 3D printing of batteries, so this field is very dear to my heart also. Now, you know, Becky, the Berkeley Energy and Climate Institute, is set up to integrate the whole of the lab, the, the large lab up on the hill, and also the whole of the campus, so everybody in this room can play some kind of role in being proactive in Becky. A large part of one of our big quadrants is the policy, law, business aspect, so everyone in this room could work with one of the professors in the business school, the law school, and so on, the Goldman School, to work in that quadrant. In the tech quadrant, we have all of the Energy Biosciences Institute, uh, Energy Efficiency, and the large groups that are in engineering and science that do the basic technology and science. What's also interesting, and why Berkeley is so important in this area, is that we have a lot of large groups in carbon sequestration. There are many, many of them are on the hill, some of them are in the College of Chemistry, and this differentiates us from most other universities to have that deep bench science in sequestration, because after all, we've got all the carbon in the environment, we've got to keep cleaning it up. And then fourthly, especially in the College of Natural Resources, are large groups that do adaptation and mitigation, because as we know, sad but true, the carbon levels are going up. We're having more and more storms like, uh, like Sandy, and we already are on a trajectory which is dangerous, and we need more uh, scientists in carbon and, uh, and in, in the adaptation part. So students, um, Abigail and Grace asked me to specifically address how students can get involved. 
Uh, we do have a little bit of money in Becky to fund uh, SWAT teams of students to do things like uh, a heat map of the, uh, of the campus to see where all of those energy programs are. We did just start a degree in energy engineering, actually, so there are formal programs that are starting. And we have the Philomathia conference coming up on November the 1st, and I'd like to organize some poster sessions at that conference, which would be a heavy, heavy strongly coming from Burke. Uh, the C2M program that Brian Steele and uh, uh, Beverly Alexander run, you know that's a very active program, you know that already, so there are many activities. Reaching out to our alums, I, for example, just spent a lot of time in the last few months with John Woolard, who was the ex-CEO of BrightSource. He developed a lot of that technology whilst he was working at the lab between businesses. And so there's a big, big rich activity on the Berkeley campus that can get plumbed for this kind of stuff. And in industry, uh, my own work has always involved industrial funding from companies like Ford and Siemens, which we, we have large uh, funding from them. And they're doing work which is really promoting the uh, industrial growth with a good carbon footprint that, that Tom just talked about. And it's really interesting that jobs, lots of jobs, are returning to the states. And it's happened more and more in the last two years. The three reasons for that are, number one, is that it's true that the, the labor gap between China and the US is shrinking. So there are better reasons, just pure economically, to bring uh, uh, manufacturing back to the United States. The second big reason is the reason why we're all here. Energy in the United States has become much cheaper in the last five years. And with the innovations that we're promoting in these areas like solar, wind, and so forth, uh, we're going to get even cheaper energy, and that brings jobs back. Thirdly, one that doesn't quite often hit the headlines is that because of the fact that Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, GE, all had to compete with Chinese cheap labor, manual labor, a lot of investment in the last two or three decades in flexible automation has really made our work environment much more flexible, and so we have a big advantage in that regard. For example, I took some students to the Tesla factory just a few weeks ago, and if you walk through Tesla, it's just manned by KUKA robots and sure processes, uh, the big depressors that make the cars. This is a very high-tech operation, and if we make more companies like Tesla, like GE Wind Power, like First Solar, these are the companies that can really make uh, America a fantastic place to create jobs and be innovative. So, I want to join Tom and say, I'm another person that quit their job to really make this happen. Uh, I also have four children, uh, one of whom is very young, and uh, I'm really concerned about the climate, I'm really concerned about energy, and that's why I'm standing in front of you. And in a meeting the other night, to close with a little bit of humor, I want to inspire you. If you've been driving around the Bay Area in the last few months, you'll have seen these signs from Prudential Insurance Company. They're blue and yellow. They look like cow colors. They're talking about retirement. One of them says, one in three children born today will live to be 100. There's another one that says, the first person that's going to live to be 150 is alive today. So which one of you in this room do you think that is? That's an interesting thought. If one of you lives to be 150 and you simply take the data, I'm not talking about complicated science, the data that's coming from the top of that pure air on the top of a mountain in Hawaii crossed 400 parts per million a little while ago. You all know that. Everybody in this room must have read that. And my students and I just went to the NASA website where there's a quadratic equation that you can fit that experiment. This is data. It's not experimental data. You fit that. That curve is going to hit 800 around the time that my youngest child and my two grandchildren are going to be 100. The person in this room that might live to be 150, if they're on that curve, are going to see carbon levels of 1,200 parts per million. That's untenable. If it was 1,200 parts per million in this room, You'll have already gone to sleep and not listening to me. Most of you seem to be looking at me right now, so I don't think you're asleep. But these are amazing data, and that's why I quit my job. That's why Tom quit his job, and that's why I'm here today, and why Becky and all of you are far more important than anything I can do. Let's do it together. Go Bears, and we're going to really make a big difference to this energy and climate environment. Thank you.
Thank you, Paul. And the last few thank yous, most of all, to our conference organizers. Matt Penfold, could you raise your hand? Thank you. And Jen Barnett, who couldn't be here with us today, but Matt has put an extraordinary amount of time into organizing this wonderful day for us. We'd like to also thank our volunteers who have been wearing the gray shirts and helping out with the conference as well, and our leadership team, and of course our sponsors. And most of all, to you, our wonderful audience who has come here today to engage with us on these important issues of our time. And please enjoy the reception at the Stadium Up the Hill. Thank you again.